I want to talk to you about um, data in a European context um, and, and what kind of sources there are. But first off, talk a bit about open data and what that means. Um, so I work for the Open Knowledge Foundation. We're a nonprofit based in the UK, but kind of active globally. And our mission is basically to create tools and communities around open knowledge, and in particular around open government data and around data that comes from, um, from public sources. Um, the idea there is basically that we can build technology platforms that enable people to cooperate to better understand um, what is going on in politics, but also to better kind of consume texts, for example, that are in the public domain and similar materials. Um, so, in terms of locating open data, this is probably very wrong in, 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 many, in many senses, but I find it very useful as a kind of day-to-day -day tool. Um, the idea of, of how do these things relate together. So that's basically the question, what do you need to do? And that's the question, what, what are they doing in, in terms of releasing and non -re not releasing the data? So um, I, I think, I think um, the better data comes out with voluntary release, right? All the stuff that you get um, that has not been released voluntarily is normally prone to errors, and even if it doesn't have errors, you can't really prove that it's good. And um, then, of course, what we want is we want the data to just come to our labs rather than to have to go hunt for it and, and spend month and month Writing, writing freedom of information requests or arguing about whether some exception applies or wh whether it doesn't apply. Um, so in that kind, of, that kind of setup, I think the ideal dream state is that all the information that is interesting, that is politically relevant, that is relevant for people to understand what's going on in their country would just be re released proactively. And there's three main kind of concerns that I think have to apply to, to this kind of proactive release. The first one is about you have to be able to reuse it on a legal level. So um, more and more, I think, uh, copyright intellectual property is being used in areas where it was not originally intended. I don't know about um, the specific situation here in Austria, but in Germany, for example, we had an, um, um, we had a, um, had an exception to the copyright um, law um, that said legal, uh, kind of public documents are not subject to this law. But then in 2003, the European Union introduced data by, uh, database rights, and those kind of override this, this, uh, this uh, rule and basically introduce copyright for, for databases, thereby making it potentially a breach of copyright to data mine public, public information. So the solution to that is explicit licensing. There's a set of open licenses. That's where the open in and open data comes from. So licenses that allow anyone to reuse the information for any purpose, um, including commercial and non-commercial usage. Um, the second thing is raw data, right? So you don't want to have just the PDF file. You don't want to get just kind of the, the, the filtered aggregate. You want to get the, uh, the rawest format that's available because that is where you can run the, most, run the most analysis on. That is what gives you the most detail, and you can still get it into a nice and PDF format if, if that's what, what your specific use requires. But um, going from, from a kind of restricted format down to um, raw data is not often easy, but sometimes it's not possible at all. And the final thing is kind of more subtle, which is, I think, about access and how hard is it to find this information. So um, w w when, when you look for government information, there's this phenomenon that you basically have to understand government first before you can find out where the information is, is, is placed. So um, that, that includes finding out which ministry is responsible for, um, for, 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 the, for, the information, for keeping the information that you're interested in often, but it goes even further. You have to find out which department within the ministry is responsible for this. You even have to find out sometimes what the database is called and in order to be even able to write a, write a freedom of information request that is specific enough. And basically, this means you have to do a lot of research just to get to some very basic information. And that's why I think it's, it's important also that things like the data portals that are going to be, I think, the subject of the next talk are being created to make this, um, to make this data more accessible. Um, and the whole point of this is basically to, stifle, uh, to, 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 to encourage external actors to use the data in creative ways. And uh, this is also where a certain ambiguity comes in because there is both kind of creative uses for government information that are about creating new business, about creating new, new business models, um, but also uses that are about creating a better public, creating better uh, information, and of course, creating better, better journalism. Um, but these are, these are basically all uses of 
um, the same type of data. I don't think it's very often the very same data. So there's data that is better for launching a successful app in the, uh, in the, in the App Store for, for Apple, and there's data that's better for actually tracking what government does. Um, so, but anyway, the idea is to, to really have kind of external value creation. Um, just to say, what I'm working on is a project called Open Spending. We started in, in a number of countries in the UK as Where Does My Money Go, in Germany as Offener Haushalt. And basically the idea is we want to make it easy for people to analyze and understand and visualize budgetary information from governments, but also more granular spending information about who has received which funds from government when. And um, this is interesting as a kind of research project. I think it's interesting for journalists, but I think it's also interesting in the sense that what we're trying to build is kind of a platform for other people to reuse very easily. So we're trying to basically make a tool that scales across different countries, across different legal systems, and that's very hard. In general, I do think that we can, we can have open data um, sites such as open spending, but also um, other sites um, such as open corporates, which does the same thing for companies' information, and um, many, many other sites, like, um, like even FOI sites, we can see them as kind of a platform for journalism. And I don't know how well this will work out, but the idea is basically um, the data that, that um, has, been, has been released by government needs to be refined a bit, it needs, to be, it, needs to be, it needs to be prepared, it needs to be put out in public, and then this is where you can really start doing the, doing, doing the journalistic work more easily, more readily. And I think that this is where there's a lot of kind of overlap between between the open data movement and data journalism, and that's also why I'm here, basically. Um, to go into two, two specific areas, this is my um, map of the European um, budget, and I think it's a very interesting thing to look at, if only to, to, to look at how kind of um, a weird type of government works. I, I like to look at, at budgets and at spending information, not only as, as to, in order to find corruption, but also just as evidence of how this government is really structured and of, of how it's really working. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with how the European Union right now manages its money. Um, probably not as many. This is okay because right now it's 0.7% I think of GDP. That's okay to not know about. Maybe in, in two or three years it's going to be 10% given, based on what, what may be happening over the next few weeks. And then I think it will, will no longer be okay not to know about what's, what's in there and how it's working. Um, so what, what, what is in there right now, there's basically three big areas. This is um, farm and fish subsidies. It's all the support that's being given to farmers, but also big, um, how do you call them, uh, big agricultural companies in order to, to, uh, run, um, to run their business. Um, it's interesting because this money, or these funds were created quite early um, in, in the European Union, or I think even in the Europäische uh, Gemeinschaft, and um, so what kind of happened historically is I think this stuff goes mostly to the, to the old European countries. And then there's this part, which is kind of very interesting as well. It's the European Regional Policy Funds. Um, so this is all the money that's handed out in order to have local development to um, build all the fantastic kind of things that you, that you always see. I don't know, the theaters, but also streets in, in Eastern Europe. And because um, this is kind of the how do you say, the, the, the political kind of um, counterbalance to that. This is being mostly given to the newer um, new European states. So um, this includes the European Regional Development Fund and the European Social Fund. And finally, there's like this, this pocket money, which is for research and uh, atomic research in particular. Um, so, so this is the main sectors. And in terms of getting this data, this stuff used to be very well available because some people had put a lot of work into making it available, in particular a group called EU Transparency. Um, what's happened, I think, a year and a half ago, or two years ago, is the European Court of Justice decided that privacy was a really important concern and that the names of the farmers that um, were recipients of subsidies would no longer be published. This has basically not only destroyed the publishing of, of, of that part of the data, but it has pretty much stopped the, the release of the data throughout. I think they, they recently put out a press statement saying that 92% of the funds weren't published any longer. So you can get this up to 2010, 2011, but then it stops. And um, I think maybe we're going to talk about this later. This isn't going to get better anytime soon. Um, this stuff here, um, the European kind of regional development money, it is kind of being published. 
Um, you can find it on, on lots, of, lots of websites. It is mostly published as PDF files, so there's a lot of effort to kind of get this into a format where you can actually say, hey, how much has been spent on this country versus this country? How much has been, has been spent on which policy objective, on which program? Um, and I think right now there's only been one, one really su su successful effort at ever collecting this, uh, and that's been by the Financial Times who did this, I think, in 2011 or 2010 already. 10, yeah. Um, so, I've, uh, by, by the way, you don't need to write any of this down. There's, there's kind of a link up here where I've put up, put up a bit of information about this. And finally, this bit, this is kind of very well published. You can get it up to date, um, no problem. Um, the problem here is basically this stuff is being reported not by the European Commission or by, by um, the central European authorities, but by each individual region within the European Union. Um, okay, so that's, that's kind of a slight overview of how the EU manages its money right now. We don't know how it'll do that in a, in a year. Um, there's also a very interesting process right now, which is about renegotiating um, the European kind of budget. Um, they have these, how many years is it, 2003 to 2000. 13 and then 2014 to 2020 will be another kind of budgeting period and right now there's all the discussions about how this 2014 budgeting period and um, the multi-annual kind of financial period will look like and that's a very interesting project uh, thing to look into um, and then there is all the other stuff and that's a bit uh, going to be a bit chaotic here but just to kind of give a give a kind of brief survey of the stuff that's out there um, because on the European level, there's a lot of information available, and by definition, it always applies to your member state, to your country as well, to some degree. Um, so one thing to, uh, that's very interesting to look at is the legis uh, legislative observatory. It's the, um, the website of the European Parliament, where, all the, uh, where they're tracking basically the progress of different laws. There's also another site called IPEX. Um, which is basically where they try to combine what's happening in the European Parliament to what's happening in the different national parliaments. And that's a process that's so chaotic that I th don't think anyone has a solid understanding of what's happening there. Another thing that's really interesting to look at is TET. TET stands for Tennis Electronic Daily. It's basically where every, every procurement process that is above a certain limit, I think 100,000 euros, um, from uh, throughout Europe has to be published. And... Um, they, they, basically, you can get a, get a historic uh, side of what procurement, uh, what kind of t tender documents have been put out. What, of course, isn't available, except in Slovakia and a few other countries, is what contracts were actually made on that basis. So that information still needs to be freed up somehow. Um, other things that are interesting, of course, there's Eurostat. Um, which basically gives you very good statistics if you need to have some of the normal stats. But I don't, I don't think that for journalistic purposes, um, using just Eurostat will get you anywhere. Eurostat is nice if you need GDP to compare GDP to something else. So that's, that's basically how, you, how you'd use it. Um, and then there's a few, few more um, exotic things. One of them is the European Investment Bank. They have a quite a lot of data. I haven't really gotten around to analyzing it yet, but it seems very interesting. What's a bit disappointing is the European Central Bank, because right now that'd be an interesting kind of candidate to analyze, but the data is kind of lagging behind quite badly. I think for most of the data sets, they only report kind of twice a year, maybe once a year, and that means right now it's, it's pretty much unusable. And the final thing I wanted to mention is um, there's the European um, Lobby Register, and that's very interesting if you want to look at who's investing money from Austria to make, um, to make policy in, or to, to, to help create better policies on, on a European stage. Um, so so, so that's, that's basically some of the sources. There's, there's, a num num there's a number of other things that are in this pad that's been created by a journalist called Kellen Barr. Um, that you will find when you follow this link and um, it's really kind of worth just digging through the EU stuff a bit. Often you find stuff that's relevant to, to the national politics, often you find stuff that's just plain interesting. Um, so that, that was a very quick survey. Just to say, I think um, Liliana also spoke, already spoke extensively about the um, Data Journalism Handbook. There's another initiative that we're working on which is called the School of Data. Um, you can go, go to schoolofdata.org. What we're trying to do is basically to create a set of online courses. I don't think they can replace anything like meeting up with other people like in this, in this environment and, and kind of doing some intense stuff. But if you want to learn a specific skill about dealing with data, this is where we hope to kind of provide some online courses in the near future. Um, that's all I have for now. Thank you.